WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... Hi, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is Tom Wicker, the distinguished columnist of the New York Times, one of the most influential syndicated journalists in the United States. It's a very special pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Of all your books, your most recent on press, is a lively, semi-autobiographical account, your experiences over the last three decades in the press, with important conclusions about the relationship between the press and our society. Tom, you have many observations and conclusions about the role of the press in America. What do you consider to be the most important judgment in your book? Well, um, I'm not sure about the most important, but uh, the one that I sort of wind up with, and I think that may be the most controversial in the book uh, is uh, the conclusion that I've come to in my lifetime in the press, 30 years now, that uh, so far from being uh, as uh, belligerent and uh, challenging and uh, powerful as many people seem, seem to think the press is, and in most of my experience uh, it's been more nearly uh, uh, timid and unwilling really to uh, provoke controversy, uh, and I uh, feel that the likelihood is that the press will uh, relapse into that more quiescent mood once the current uh, fad for investigative journalism that stems out of uh, Watergate uh, passes. And when do you foresee that occurring? Well, I don't know that I could make any prediction like that, but I think it's just a natural thing that the more controversy that the press uh, finds itself involved in, the more we publish uh, controversial stories and uh, bring down on ourself, uh, ourselves criticism from the government, from business leaders and so forth, why uh, there's going to come some point at which uh, editors and publishers just simply begin to retreat because uh, people don't like to live in the eye of controversy all the time. And the press in America, the press that I'm writing about, the metropolitan press, the television networks, so forth, is fundamentally an establishment press in the long run. And uh, members of the establishment don't like to be outside the establishment. Well, this mass scrutiny that you describe that the press has suddenly come under, I guess there are many people in America who agree with the watchdog importance of the press, but have come to feel what you describe, and that is that the press has perhaps more freedom than it has a sense of responsibility. Do you agree with that judgment? Well, yes, I think that uh, it's true that we have uh, freedom guaranteed by the Constitution. Uh, nothing guarantees responsibility, and nothing uh, uh, can impose responsibility uh, unless it in some way impairs the freedom which hasn't happened yet in this, in this uh, country. But I think that um, that's not quite the same thing as saying that we've got an irresponsible press. I think it's true that we have a press that on occasion is, ir is irresponsible, or some uh, uh, institutions of that press at least are on occasion irresponsible. And I think that that kind of irresponsible, that, kind of, that occasional irresponsibility is simply the price that uh, you pay for, uh, for the, uh, the benefits and the strengths of a free press. Uh, all freedom, uh, if it's real freedom, uh, risks some irresponsibility in the, in the exercise of that freedom. And that's true of press freedom, no less than any other kind. You talk about a number of the, I guess, deadly sins of journalism in your <laughs> book. There are quite a few of those. <laughs> Why don't you share some of them with us? Well, um, of course, there are many uh, of which probably the one that most uh, readers uh, may come into contact with and uh, feel abused or uh, offended by is uh, sensationalism. Uh, you know, when, uh, when a story is, uh, is tricked up into all kinds of, uh, of uh, pr with prurient details or with uh, sensational details, it really don't add very much to anybody's knowledge and you think that uh, you can only conclude that the newspaper is trying to sell papers, as they say. That's I think one of the most besetting sins of journalism, although not so much in America today as I think probably was the case 25, 30 years ago or more. Um, inaccuracy is one of the, one of the worst uh, sins of the press, and I suspect that most of the people that are uh, viewing this program who've ever been involved in any way in a newspaper story found something wrong with it. And that isn't because the press is, is, is uh, incompetent, it's just because uh, that it's, uh, it's very difficult to get every uh, final detail right in what may, may be a very complex story. There may be three, four, five witnesses. Is that witnesses the curse of dailiness? 
No, that's just, uh, it's just, uh, so, you know, if uh, we heard the people. screech of brakes and ran to the window and witnessed an automobile accident uh, and there are three of us uh, there and a reporter comes up to interview it, I guarantee you we'll give him three different versions because we'll see three different things, we'll perceive it. So when he tries to put that story together into uh, a one coherent version, all three of us are going to think it's wrong because it's not our version, you see. It, it happens that way. But it's uh, even on details, just getting someone's middle initial right. It's very easy to make mistakes of that kind, and we do it enough to, to I think, to uh, damage ourselves. Um, dailiness is one of the, it's, it's a word that I used in my book, is one of the real problems of journalism. It isn't a sin so much. As, and by that I mean that before we've been able to cope with what happened today, uh, along comes another avalanche of events uh, tomorrow. And before we're able to cope with that, there comes the following day. Um, it's very much like waves coming on a beach, and one of them knocks you down before you can pick yourself up, another one comes along on top of it. And I think that detracts greatly from the power of the press because there's just simply so much that we have to cope with in modern newspapers and a, t and a broadcasting news operation. We can't either be very expert in all that range of subjects, nor can do we have the, uh, the time and the personnel really to, uh, to be uh, very uh, coherent or analytical about these events, and it's hard enough just to decide what's important enough to put in the paper out of all the many things that you might choose. Uh, it's far more difficult to put them in the paper in some sensible relationship to one another, in some sensible relationship to what happened yesterday with some sense of cause and effect. Very difficult. Um, and I, then I think that that's a problem more than a sin. As I said, there are, there are a lot of other sins of journalism, though, and I think probably one that I have seen most often uh, and is most insidious in a way, particularly in Washington or with reporters covering government anywhere, I think is the, is the, the likelihood that the reporter at some point covering the White House or whatever uh, is going to feel himself a, a, a part of the institution that he's covering rather than an instrument of the, of the public. That is to say, you know, if you invited in for a private conversation with the president's uh, national security advisor and he advises you that uh, uh, we, of course you automatically assume he means the president too, uh, we, we think you, the reporter, really are a very knowledgeable fellow about uh, Europe, let's say, and we like the way you write. And you can't write what I'm going to tell you now, but uh, we think you ought to know this because it would inform you. Well, the first thing you know, you really feel like you're a confidant of the president, you see, and uh, that's uh, that's a very insidious and dangerous thing because if you enjoy that, you'll want to keep that relationship and it might lead you not to write what you ought to write. Uh, if uh, one of your colleagues has that kind of relationship, you're going to want to get in there too, you know, and uh, it's, uh, it's a very dangerous thing. How to, far uh, in can you be without being out or how far out can you be well, that's, that's without being in? That's what's difficult because obviously no reporter can function, particularly when you're covering without an institution access. like the White House, without mm -hmm. some degree of access. and. Uh, so you have to cultivate sources, and you have to, uh, to some extent, play the game with them of, uh, of getting the, some of what they want to get into the paper, even though you, it may not be precisely the way you want to put it into the paper. You can't just simply ignore what your news. It's it's all, always very difficult to to figure out precisely the line at which you have ample access, but at which uh, you still retain your independence, uh, and it's not 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 always easy. You mentioned an anecdote in On Press about a speech that you gave, I think, in eastern Pennsylvania just about a year ago, so ago, and someone stood up and said to you, what gives you the right to tell the American people what you think? You have a very moving explanation of how you felt. I wonder if you could tell us what was your reply then and what your thoughts have been since then? Well, actually, the question was more pointed than that. It wasn't what gives me the right to tell the American people what I think. It was what gives me the right to tell the American people what, what to, to think. What to think, yes. Right. And uh, I replied that I didn't think I did that. And that, as a matter of fact, if I did, the world would be a very different place from what it is because mm -hmm. my, uh, my views on policy are not very widely <laughs> accepted. Uh, uh, but I, I tried to, beyond saying that uh, I thought the question had merit, uh, even though I don't think I tell the American people what to think, I do give them a very, the people who read my column, I give them a very uh, full range, uh, you know, a hot furnace blast of my opinions there. And uh, I think the American people are sensible enough and intelligent enough, uh, and they have other sources of information, and they make up their own minds about things. I don't worry too much about telling people what to think, because I don't think anybody can do that. 
but it's a fair question. What gives me the right to you? To what gives me that forum, and uh, who am I to be making all these judgments and so forth? And I don't know uh, what answer you can give except to um, cite your qualifications. You know, in my case, I've been in newspaper work for 30 years. I've been ar around uh, covering Washington and lived there most of the time since 1957. Uh, uh, and I've. But in general, what gives the columnist the right? In fact, that's one of the points you touch on, that they are a little bit different from, different from you and me. I mean, the you out there. Well, in the first you place... You talk about their experience and their long-term association and right. well, first I, I, name, first idea familiarity. Well, that's right. Uh, you have uh, most columnists, I think, uh, have been around a long time, so they developed experience. Uh, they've got some knowledge. They know a lot of people, uh, if not just politicians and government officials. But I know a lot of people on college faculties, for example, that I can call and ask for information. Even if I don't know them, uh, the fact that I have a forum makes people like that accessible to me. And I think uh, you have to, the public should understand, too, that part of being a reporter, being a journalist, is, is that you're a privileged spectator. Now, you know, the entire American public can't go to the White House News Conference uh, because there's not that much room for 200 million people. Uh, so those few people who, by the end of their profession, uh, go there are really going there as, as representatives of the American public. And uh, so in a sense, you're a privileged spectator. I've been going to White House news conferences ever since President Eisenhower, and, and you develop a sense of those men. Uh, it's the same with interviewing senators or mayors or, or governors or whoever. Only a few of us uh, are in the profession that has the opportunity to do that. So. Um, I, I think we do have uh, a special position and uh, specialized information. And also, uh, over a, a lifetime, just as a lawyer comes to know his business and the doctor uh, his or hers, um, and newspaper people come to know something about politics and government or whatever the field it is that they're covering. And uh, so I think we're qualified to offer ideas and opinions. The American people are very qualified to reject them if they don't, uh, if they don't like them. And believe me, my mail suggests to me that they do. And they do, On what they subject do, uh, have you received sometimes. the most mail? What well, uh, there's several that, that uh, just evoke mail that mm -hmm. you can't, uh, can't even imagine. Uh, the death penalty, for one. I'm opposed to the death penalty, and I say so quite forcefully. And that, that evokes not only a lot of mail, but also very uh, distressing mail. I mean, people who write really very abusive was, letters. I always thought animal uh, welfare was the number one letter response subject. Well, I never get into that subject very mm -hmm. much, so I don't we get any letters have. on that. <laughs> <laughs> we may just have. may get it. Uh, abortion, you get a tremendous amount of mail on, on that issue. Currently, uh, uh, the, on the uh, Middle East situation, I'm the recipient of a lot, a lot of mail. I think you would be either way you, mm -hmm. you looked at that. Mm -hmm. um, the most interesting thing that happened to me recently, I wrote a piece that I thought was almost a throwaway piece. It mm -hmm. was uh, on a day when I'd been doing a lot of work on another subject. It was very complex, and I finally re realized I didn't really have enough time left to write a column. So what was I going to do? And I, I hurriedly threw together a piece that I had been wanting to do at some time, kind of a humorous piece, I thought, about the difficulties for a writer nowadays of using the phrase, you have to say his and hers, or oh, his yeah. or her, mm. rather than he or she. And you cited uh, a, himself a, or herself, an English you know. professor or something? Cited an English professor who had devised a new mm. language for <laughs> these, uh, these uh, gender-inclusive uh, pronouns, you know. And uh, <laughs> so I wrote what I thought was a funny piece, and uh, that was <laughs> early in April, and the mail hadn't stopped coming in yet. In support or uh, denial of your position? Probably the single biggest flow of mail I ever got on anything came as a result of that. Some from feminists who thought I was being too flippant about the thing. Some from feminists who were grateful that I'd raised the issue. Some from uh, male chauvinist uh, pigs, so to speak, who, uh, who were very defiant about it all. A lot from, uh, from grammar purists. Mm -hmm. An astonishing number of letters from people who'd invented their own uh, uh, mm. pronouns. It's a very interesting situation. Are you going to do a follow-up? I did do a follow-up, but uh, I'm going to have to cut it off or I'll be snowed under with the mail. Well, you don't usually write columns that really are designed to achieve desi uh, definable goals. For example, you don't write, I assume, specifically to get a bill passed or a person elected. No, no, I don't regard that as the columnist business. The editorial page in a newspaper is, uh, is it's editorial. It's a sub page of advocacy. And the editors of our paper, I'm not a member of the Times editorial board, none of our columnists are. The editors of our paper, uh, they endorse candidates and support bills and oppose bills and all that sort of thing. I think the columnist I role is much more needed to deal with ideas. Uh, and 
if I just wrote a piece uh, of supporting some bill that's moving through Congress, uh, I mean, that's an editorial, it seems to me, and I leave that to the editorial page as much as I can. If, however, there's a complex bill in Congress that raises a lot of issues, for example, the bill just passed in the Senate and now pending in the House to uh, require a court warrant for wiretaps, even in the case of foreign intelligence mm -hmm. wiretaps, which have never been, uh, warrants never been required before. It's a very complex bill, and it raises a lot of issues, First Amendment issues, uh, uh, constitutional issues, privacy, you know, very, very complex bill. And I think that the columnist uh, can be very useful in, uh, in sorting through some of those issues, pointing out possibilities. Then you have something happens like uh, the, the Carter administration is supporting that bill, for example, and then they turn around and use a warrantless wiretap to in, this, in the recent uh, Humphrey Trong spy trial. You know. Why do they do that? It's interesting to, to, to try to find out why this apparent conflict. It turns out not to be a conflict at all, in a way. But, uh, so I think the columnist does that sort of thing uh, best and really stays out of advocacy. You said earlier if one were to listen to your views, uh, policy would be much different than it is uh -huh. now. What is the current state of your liberalism? Well, uh, my liberalism is like um, any other kind of liberalism. It's a, it's a, very, uh, it's a very mixed bag because that's a very... Uh, a very large round word and it includes a lot of things. I'm actually what I would regard as a conservative on, uh, on, uh, on civil liberties issues, Bill of Rights issues. Um, I believe that the uh, government should uh, not wiretap people, for example, uh, and I don't think that uh, FBI agents ought to uh, enter your house and, uh, and, and take documents without a warrant for going into your house. Well, that's a conservative position, it seems to me. Uh, I'm probably uh, much more liberal by uh, normal by uh, u the usual definitions on uh, economic issues, for example. So uh, it's. Uh, for example, what? Well, um, I would uh, be much more willing than uh, than uh, President Carter has been, for example, to try to tackle the problem, the economic problem, which leads on into great social problems. I think of. Uh, of youth unemployment, particularly in the cities, for example. I would be willing to spend more money f to achieve what I see as a good purpose out there at the end, and most fiscal conservatives uh, rear back in horror from that. On the other hand, I'm, uh, see how easily these things can be mixed. Now, I am powerfully opposed, and I've written what I thought were blazing pieces uh, in opposition to the, uh, the uh, Social Security tax increase of last year, which I think is the biggest and most onerous tax bill ever passed in America. Um, it, it is the biggest and most onerous tax bill ever passed. So that would, might make me sound fiscally conservative. I'm opposed to, uh, to a tax increase like that. On the other hand, uh, I would be willing to see, and I think it makes sense, and I think the founders of the Social Security system originally intended that there should be a, uh, an input from the general tax revenues, the general revenues, into the support of the Social Security system. Now, now that makes most fiscal conservatives throw up their hands in horror. That's a liberal position. So it's, uh, it's um, very mixed. How do you think Jimmy Carter is doing? Obviously, uh, there is more talk in just such a short period of his presidency that it will, also, it will be a very limited presidency than I can certainly recall either being aware of or having read about any time in this century. Well, that's uh, right. I, I think he's been, uh, if you take his administration as a whole, I think it's been very disappointing. Uh, just in recent weeks, with the Panama Canal Treaty going through and the uh, Mideast jet sail package, uh, whether one is for that or against it in terms of Carter's momentum, it's, uh, uh, I think that was a good thing for him. Uh, not so good in terms of uh, voter groups that are opposed to it. Uh, I think he's beginning to, uh, to get the hang of it, so to speak, and uh, after the uh, meeting that he and his officials had at Camp David, he seems to be more aggressive. I think that the basic failure of the Carter administration in its first year and a half, roughly, in office, uh, uh, was a political failure, a failure on the part of the president really to comprehend first how to deal with Congress, uh, which is not the same thing as the Georgia legislature at all. Secondly, a failure on the part of the president uh, even to try very hard to uh, mobilize public opinion in his support. Uh, thirdly, just a, a failure of the president to understand, and uh, this, uh, I'm not making really vicious criticisms. I mean, uh, after all, the man had only been governor of Georgia for one year, and uh, the presidency is a most complex thing. And I think it was a, a third failure in his part simply to comprehend the really profoundly political nature of that office. Uh, 
and of its relationships with the other branch of government. And I think he had both a kind of an engineer's attitude that what he wanted to send up was a perfect program rather than a program that could pass. Uh, that's one thing. And, and the other thing is that I think he just believed that he could come in and rather stand above the political battle. And he was quoted in one of his news he said in one of his news conferences that he was going to continue to do what he thought was right regardless of politics. Well, no president can do that. And I think President Carter is finally, you know, really beginning to get the hang of being president, just as we that all do. He's becoming when more political? Very much so, and he has to, and, and in the best sense. You know, Someone any of us on a new job, it takes a while to, to, to get hold of it. A commentator pointed out earlier today that it was at this point in the Kennedy administration that the Bay of Pigs was six months off, and at this point in the Nixon administration, his trip to China was a full year off, and at this point in the Johnson administration, that unfortunate Tet uh, was, I guess, more That's than right. a year off as well. So We're only I, a year and a half in uh, to, to this administration. So it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, not the Bay of Pigs, but the point mm. is very well taken, I think. And uh, it's true that uh, the president is, is, well, it's not even really a year and a half yet, and he hadn't even had his first uh, congressional elections, midterm elections, which is a traditional sort of gauge mm -hmm. of how a president is done, you know, after, uh, after not e almost two years in office. And it's a long way to the primaries of 1980. It's Richard Neustadt, uh, I guess, who tells us that the year to watch for is the third year. Would you agree with that assessment? And where do you think our next president is coming from? I think uh, that's a little uh, mechanistic for me to say watch the third year, although obviously if by the third year a president is not rolling in pretty high gear, then he's going to be in deep trouble. But, you know, I think that um, uh, Pr President Carter's first year and a half, which don't look very good to anybody, uh, uh, not even I suspect to him, uh, by the end of the next year and a half, which is three years in, he might be looking uh, like a smash hit. Um, it's, it's perhaps not very likely, but just for example, if, uh, if, uh, if a really uh, favorable situation develops in the Middle East and uh, we had something that American Jews would see as a, uh, as a stable settlement favorable to, it, uh, to uh, Israel, uh, why, I mean, a lot of, I mean, Carter would begin to look like a miracle man in many ways, and uh, if, uh, if the, the economy continues strong and he's able to do something about inflation, which I don't really think he's going to be able to do, but if he does, then there again he would look pretty good. So it's, uh, it's very hard to tell, it's, it's uh, sometimes lost sight of now, all these years later, but uh, uh, in the fall of 1963, President Kennedy was regarded as being in deep political trouble. Uh, and, and uh, of course, no one knew who his opponent would be. And had he lived, the opponent might very well not have been Barry Goldwater. We don't know. Um, but it, it's very much too early to make any kind of judgment about Carter's uh, re-electability unless you uh, were to say, and I fear that this may be the case, it's a possibility that in the, in the media era, which we are certainly in now. And you say it's the real arena for politics. That's right. Uh, Carter may have already made an indelible impression on the American people as a, as a bumbler. Uh, if that's the case, uh, then it's going to take some really uh, uh, startling achievements, like peace in the Middle East, uh, to, to overturn that image. I don't say that he has, I say that it's just at least possible. What was your most memorable reporting experience? Well, I think that I would, it clearly would be um, the assassination of President Kennedy uh, in Dallas. I was the uh, Times White House correspondent at the time and, and was in Dallas alone that day, that is alone for the Times, until uh, oh, late in the day when other correspondents began to come there in. There is that certainly, certainly was the, the most moving account of that entire day of horror that I can ever recall reading well, in thank, on press. Well, thank you for that. It's, not, uh, that's a, it's one of those things one doesn't particularly like to uh, claim as, you know, my most memorable experience or anything of that sort because it's such a uh, sad memory for both of us, uh, for all of us. Uh, and um, nevertheless, I would say that that clearly is the, the event that stands out in my mind. What's the best story you missed? The best story that I missed? Yeah. Uh, oh, there's so many stories that I've missed. Uh, and uh, usually, however, most stories that I've missed, uh, someone else has had, so, so I, I haven't felt too badly about that. The, the stories that I regret most are those that I've written that, uh, and had published that, as one of my colleagues put it, uh, remain forever exclusive. <laughs> Those are the ones that hurt. <laughs> Any you take back publicly? Yes, I, uh, in my column in particular, um, I uh, 
every so often when they, they accumulate enough, I publish columns of uh, retractions and corrections and uh, point out where I've gone wrong and why and so on. I think you owe that to your readers. Not so much little niggling uh, uh, factual errors, all of those too, but where you really just come to a wrong conclusion, you know. Uh, I think uh, you kind of owe it to your readers to go back and say, uh, look, you know, I was wrong and here's why and uh, so forth. You talk at some length about the ability of some persons to manage the news, particularly people often in the White House or in high office. Nowadays, they don't get there if they're not pretty good news managers. <laughs> I would think so. Who are the most clever and adept news managers nowadays? Of presidents, I think you cite Mr. Kennedy as being the most adroit. That I've seen. Uh, I made a wrong judgment in my book. Uh, I thought that President Carter was going to become one of those, but. Uh, it, it, uh, it, I don't think he has so far. I believe Henry Kissinger was uh, among non-presidents about the best that I ever uh, saw. Uh, many, of course, senators and uh, congressmen, men have been around a long time, really know very well how to present themselves to the public. And uh, uh, the press uh, usually knows which, uh, which uh, official or whatever is a very clever public relations man or woman uh, for themselves. And uh, we, uh, we come to deal with that in a way. But actually, uh, usually what that really means is dealing straightforwardly with the press and uh, putting out information where it can be put out and, uh, and uh, not lying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think reporters dislike most uh, and have the most contempt for someone who just lies to you. If someone says, look, I can't tell you that, uh, I'm just not allowed to tell you that. I mean, I respect that. That's his job. And it's my job to find out some other way. But if he tells me I don't know when he did yeah. know, then... then uh, Misleading him. Yes. Are there any effective women news managers? Well, uh, there have been so few women in high political office uh, that... Out of political office as well. Out of political office. Well, I'm sure there... I'm, I'm, I'm certain there are because in, in the field of journalism, I happen to think that there are as few differences in the things uh, women and men can do in journalism as in any field that I know of. So I'm quite certain that uh, Mayor uh, uh, Koch, for example, now has, I think, uh, a woman as his press secretary. I don't, I don't know her and haven't dealt with Conway. her, but uh, the, I see no reason whatever to think that she won't be uh, as good as any man could be in that job. You mentioned earlier if any ordinary man or woman ever saw its name in the press, they would generally object to a s series of errors. What recourse does an ordinary citizen have if they feel wrong by an account in the press. We just have a brief moment left. I wonder if you can tell us. I regret to say not enough recourse, and I think that's one place that newspapers have been recalcitrant. They, they're not willing enough to admit error and try to redress people's grievances. Well, particularly in era, I guess, of intimate reporting, when one has little opportunity to evaluate the evaluator. Yeah, well, that's a nice way to talk about gossip, I take it. You mean yeah, so what is gossip and what is news? Yeah, well, uh, it's hard to draw the line sometimes, but I think, it, you know, it's like someone said, if you have to ask, you're never going to know. <laughs> One thing that is quite clear is that Tom Wicker proves again that he is as informative and as provocative and as modest in person as he always is in print. Thank you, Tom Wicker, for being with us. Thank you. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too. <laughs>